Okay, I'd like to invite our final speaker up, Mike Layton, an elected official, counselor with uh, Ward 11, University of Rosedale. So thank you so much for joining us. Great, thank you very much. We'll flip the presentations over. I was told both speakers were going to be giving presentations, so I quickly ran together and put three, three pictures in. Um, I wouldn't have felt so bad now knowing that it was only our, our, uh, our bureaucrat uh, bringing it. That's fine. Perfect. Um, great. So, hi, everyone. I, just, just very quickly, I, just, just to understand, I think, more the, the audience, who, who here thinks housing is expensive in Toronto? Now, just you can keep your hands up for a second, and I just I just want to get who's paying over thirty percent of their gross household income for housing in the city of Toronto. It's about a fifty-fifty split, and that's thirty percent. Um, this city is booming. It is growing. We have the most, if cranes in the sky were a measure of economic success, and it actually is, there's a cranes index uh, for the world, uh, then the, the city tops it in North America. And not only by like one or two cranes, by dozens of cranes over the next top city in North America. There's only a handful of cities in the world that, were, that, that compete with us. Um, but, but supply doesn't equal affordability. We have to remember that. Every time you hear the building industry, you hear a developers, you hear anyone say, well, don't, don't you want affordable housing? Don't you want to make life more affordable in Toronto? You've got to build more. Just give more. More. Let us have more stories. No, no, more, more, more. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to trickle down. We've heard that before. That doesn't happen. Any developer that tells you either A, they're going to pass on the cost of, uh, that the city makes you pay through development charges. It's going to be passed on directly to the, uh, to the homeowner or, or to the new, new home purchaser, or that, that the increasing supply will automatically drive down, drive down demand. They're trying to pull a fast one on you. If they think that the, that, that, un, that the development charges are exactly passed on to the new homeowner. Just think about it for a second. These guys are in the business of making money, right? Why in the world would they sell a housing unit for less than they could get? What are they going to turn around and say, like, oh, no, the, the government didn't make us pay the full DC uh, this time. That doesn't happen until next year. So we're going to give you a discount of about 2% of your unit. That, the fact is that's not going to happen. It doesn't happen. They sell for the maximum amount. Now, yes, if in, in, in probably when you talk about the, the city as a whole, as we drive up the availability of units, as we ensure that units are occupied and not just held vacant, yes, that can impact supply, which could have an impact on demand. But when at the scale they're thinking about the amount that we're talking about doesn't get directly passed on to, to the homeowner. Um, I think it's also, uh, it's important for us to recognize that this isn't the only tool. I know uh, Deanna mentioned this before, but before I talk about um, uh, inclusionary zoning for like five minutes, and then you say, well, this isn't the only thing. Your government can't get out of the business of building affordable housing. I'm totally there with you. We can't get out of the business of building affordable housing. We can't get out of the business of regulating tenants, uh, the relationship between tenants and landlord. We, c we will continue and will always need to fund uh, affordable housing to make it truly affordable. We will always need to be there to help protect tenants because when they get pushed out of a unit, it, it's very difficult to find another. So the, the, the role of the municipal government, my role as an elected official, I understand very well. It goes well beyond advocating for inclusionary zoning. At the same time, um, ever since 2015, uh, I've been working hard to try to push both the provincial government but also city staff to get ready for this, for the inevitability of us actually having this tool. And so we actually put forward a motion in 2015 that said, don't worry what the province is doing, you just design a system that would work for Toronto. Now that was in hopes that even if the province didn't change, that the city would put it forward anyhow and let, it, let them challenge us. Let the development industry take us to court. Because we should be driving 
uh, the, the, the road on this. We should be in the driver's seat on housing policy in this city. Now, last week we got news that uh, we're going to be taking another step backwards in bill with, with Bill 108. Um, we've heard a little bit about it here, but I think the two things to highlight uh, with respect to affordability, one directly related to inclusionary zoning, and that's this limit uh, that, that it could, I, I don't think we know for sure, but that it could very well be, um, be, be limited to use of inclusionary zoning around uh, transit stations, which in fact could, could impact us enormously in our ability to, to have this tool actually realize its potential. And then the second is limiting the, d the development charges and the Section 37 contributions. Um, and just, just, just to explain how, how that sounds like it's going to work now, is some, some provincial office is going to be calculating um, or determining what the development charges would be for the City of Toronto, as well as uh, what the community benefits package would look for. And community benefits packages can look very different community for, to community, but there are many councillors that say there's a minimum amount out of any cash contribution that we get uh, for, uh, for Section 37 community benefit that should go to affordable housing, either repairing uh, existing units or to the development of, of new units. There's a minimum amount. And the fact is, if the province take this on, we're not going to be able to do that. And I'd, I'd argue one better that the, the city is always in a negotiation with developers around, around development charges, partly because we don't want to be taken to court and have to fight for years and potentially lose over the amount that we're charging, because we have to demonstrate wh what we can charge developers for for a certain couple of years. And it's, from, uh, the, the, it's legislated from the province. And if they can challenge that, we might lose out on some of that money. So we sometimes bargain and take a, a lower amount instead. Now, we do it with the industry, not development project by development project. And so if it's the provincial office doing them, I got to tell you, with, if, if Bill 108 is any indication, developers are whispering in the ear or ears of the, the government in Ontario. And they're telling them what to write. And the problem will be if they're telling them what to write, they're going to tell, they're going to, they're going to erase a couple of those zeros beside the development charges, and all of a sudden, the rest of the city, the rest of the people that live in Toronto and work in Toronto, own property in Toronto, or rent in Toronto, will be picking up the burden of the cost of that infrastructure, the pipes under the ground, the parks that we depend on, the community centers, and yes, the affordable housing. They'll will have to pick up that price tag. If the, if, if the province decides that they're going to do their, their friends in the development industry some more favors further than what they clearly already are. I had a, d a little bit of a different number than, than Richard, but I looked up a report that our, our response to the province around inclusionary zoning, and it, it had something like 110,000 units built and 150,000 units under consideration or in the pipeline over the last decade. That's 300 thousand units. So let's take an estimate. Let's take an estimate. Let's say half of those units were in buildings with more than, than, than 100 units. That's a pretty conservative estimate, I would say. Half those buildings, maybe were over 50 or 100 units. And that's probably, there's three things about inclusionary zoning, you heard them, but I'll repeat them again. There's threshold, how big a building has to be to qualify for inclusionary zoning. There's the set aside, what percentage of units should be set aside in each development, and then there's the duration, for how long. I guess you could also say there's the affordability too in there, but those are the three or four that you're looking for. But with 300,000 units over the last decade, if we, and, and only, let's say half of them qualified for, met that threshold of the size of development, if just 10% were set aside, that's 15,000 units in the past decade that we could have brought online through this policy alone. 15,000 more affordable housing units. That is an enormous number of units. And we should not have been begging the province for the past 10 years to give us this power. And when they did, I, I, I would say they should not have made us jump through a whole bunch of hoops that, that are now going to take us two years to get through, a year, year and a bit to get through in order to put this policy for it. You know what happens every time? The, the provincial government says we're going to make a change. We get a whole bunch of development applications in that don't need to do that because they missed 
the date. I would love to tell uh, or, or suggest to our, um, our, our staff that we should make it retroactive for uh, a couple months uh, just to make sure we capture those last ones in the pipeline. But we'll, we'll be dealing with OMB cases that snuck in before the deadline of the OMB for a decade. Like it's, it's, it's really, they, they put those development applications in having no idea what they're gonna build but knowing that they need to get a placeholder in to keep, either keep their costs low or they, they, to keep, their, uh, 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 to keep a, a right of appeal. Like that's, that is what these developers are driven by. So I think it's, um, it's important to realize, and I just touched on this, that this policy, that the, the flawed policy we have, but the policy we have or we had up until last week, um, was flawed, but it, but it came, it didn't come about out of the goodwill of the government or developers. It came from a fight. It came from activists. It came from, it came from several people in this room, actually, uh, that were part of organizing around, around these issues and part of pushing and forcing a government to, to, to move on a policy and th that, that th there's a beautiful thing about that, is this has been going on forever. Like this isn't new, it's not new science. It's, uh, it, it, it's something that we can all do, and we all do it together to try to drive positive change. And the first time when the government came out and said, hey, we're doing exactly what you want, we got this policy, and then we read it and said, meh, you know what, it's not any good. It's not helpful. And so we went out and pushed them again. And you know what, the second time they finally got the picture. And they said, please stop protesting in front of our offices. We'll write whatever you want. Just stop protesting in front of our offices. And the great thing is, like that, that is mobilizing. That is, is getting to change. And when, when I think about the last couple of months, when I think about how tough it's been over the last uh, a, a couple, of, a couple of months, it gives me a little bit uh, of hope that, that those lessons that we've seen that worked in the past might in fact be able to happen again. And, and we're seeing it, we're seeing cracks, right? We see, we're seeing the provincial government turn on issues. We're seeing, quite frankly, our city government turn on some of those issues, take a bit of a different tone. Maybe, maybe start to be a little bit more vocal about what the province is doing. We're seeing a mayor go from, uh, from, from his first, first executive meeting, I kid you not, first executive meeting, there was an item on the agenda about the sale of Toronto Hydro. There was a room full of deputants. Before a single deputant spoke, they got up and said, we're gonna defer this item right away, and uh, to, we're gonna refer it to staff, so, so make sure it never comes back, and we don't want any of you to depute. And they did that immediately shut it down, said this is another order of government, it's none of our business. Yesterday, the mayor sent a letter to every conservative MPP in the city of Toronto outlining certainly that what the province is doing is entirely our business. That's a big change, right? Like that's, that's a very conservative, very beige, sort of middle of the road mayor actually taking a pretty direct and bold stand against some people that are his friends. Like they go to the, the country club together. They're fundraising on the same panels. They're like, he was their leader at one point in time, right? Like it's, it's there, there is change uh, that, that can happen, um, but it takes, uh, it, it takes all of us. It takes all of us organizing, it takes all of us being ready. And so if I'd have to leave you with anything, it would be, if you're not plugged in with ACORN, if you're not plugged in with Progress Toronto, if you're not plug plugged in with one of the organizations that are mobilizing, that are activating people around any issue, if it's inclusionary zoning and housing, if it's around transit, if it's around the environment. If you're not plugged into one of these groups and, and taking those action steps, no matter how small, signing a petition, going out and handing out flyers, if, if you're not doing that, then that's something you really need to question yourself about. That's something you need to say, am I doing all I can to stand up for what I believe in this province? And, and I would, I'll leave you on just, just the note that it might just take a couple minutes, but if we mobilize in, in, in large numbers, if we're ready, like, and I'll just give this one example, like in the next couple of months when we start to see the policy that uh, Deanne has been working on come forward uh, at the city, uh, we, we're gonna need 
that, that push. We're going to need to know there's a community out there in support of that. Uh, but but as, the, as we see uh, these things move, if you're, if you're not ready to get up and take a stand, um, then, then you, need, you need to prepare yourself for that. Uh, because those opportunities will come. Um, it'll be likely, uh, very likely, uh, it, it will be um, not the best timing. I've had to change my, my life schedule with my kids on several occasions as a result of, uh, uh, of many of these Ford fights. Uh, they're not convenient, uh, but they're necessary. And so I'd urge you all to get involved with either ACORN outside with Progress Toronto or one of the other groups uh, working on, on any of these issues. Uh, and, and really, uh, really put all of your energy into this. These fights happen every generation, and this is apparently going to be ours. So thank you very much.